Hi, uh, welcome to another uh, re video review of a uh, Arcadia game uh, for the Emerson Arcadia 2001. This is Space Attack. This is cartridge number two, as you can see here from the box cover. You might notice a couple of similarities between this cover and some famous ships from a certain series called Star Wars. You'll notice there's a snow speeder down at the uh, foreground of the picture. And off in the distance, you see the Millennium Falcon and what kind of looks like to me a Star Destroyer, maybe, I guess. Um, as with all the Arcadia covers that are made for the Emerson, this looks like it was drawn pretty quickly and then used with a marker or maybe some acrylic paint to fill in some color really quick. Um, if an artist spent um, an hour on this, I'd be surprised. Despite that, I I've mentioned before that I do admire some of this art. Um, the, the system was kind of hastily thrown together, it seems. And despite that, there's some things to like about it, uh, which is why I have a multi-card for it and several of the original games in their boxes. I compare this a lot in my mind to the um, Astrocade uh, that was released by Bally about three years earlier, um, and maybe even a little bit more than that. Uh, it was released in January of 1978, whereas this was released in uh, 1982. They have a lot in common. They weren't too popular. Um, I'd love to know how many of the Arcadias were sold just in the United States. So I did uh, note down some additional information about this system's box and the insides of it that I didn't note before in my previous video, which was for the first cartridge for this system, which was Cat Tracks. This box is seven and a half inches tall. It's five and 11 sixteenths inches wide, and it's one and a one eighth inch thick. So this is the front of the box. The back of the box, like the... Um, back of the cartridge shows some in information and instructions. You know, I've never actually looked carefully. Are they the same? Yeah, yeah they look they look approximately the same. My favorite part is always that at the end, I think of every single box, it always says fun for all the family. Yeah, well, in this case, I, this game would be a, a difficult one to get through for the whole family, I think. But it's, it's an interesting game nonetheless. Um, I'll get into more of that in the details later. So, as I said, this is the back of the box. There's never any screenshots, at least not in the back of the Emerson boxes that I've seen. And I think I've seen most of them, at least in screenshots. And here we've got the spine of the box. The spine um, is colorful, and it gives you a good indicator of what the game would look like if you were looking at it straight on, and you had, I don't know, 22 of these lined up on your shelf. This picture is something I tried to do um, so that you can get a better idea what the box looks like if you had one and were holding it in your hand. It's kind of hard to get a, a, a picture of what it would be otherwise. Um, but as you can see here, like I said, this is about one inch thick. They're, they're good size. I guess they're about the same size as a 2600 box, approximately. This is what the inside of the box looks like. I've never seen an overlay for this game. It doesn't really need one since you turn it on and you basically start shooting at the baddies. Uh, this is a game like Space Invaders, uh, more in common with Galaxian. Next up, we have the front of the manual. This manual is uh, a trifold. It's three and a half pages of text inside of it. This manual is uh, six and three sixteenths inches high by four and 11 sixteenths inches wide. It's maybe, you know, very thin since it's just folded a piece of paper three times. Um, there's actually a supplementary piece of paper, um, which is a supplement for the instructions. It includes how you can pause the game, which in this case, like all the other Emerson games that I've come across so far, they call it freezing. There's also a demo you can see. They had a demo that the player wasn't very smart and that's the case in this game as well. So now that I'm looking at this uh, cartridge, I'm noticing something I haven't noticed before. Um, the actual cover art for the box has been cropped heavily. And so there's actually a TIE fighter on the cover as well um, as another ship that you can't even well, I guess you can see it in the uh, on the box cover, but not very much. So what I'll try to do here is I will try to compare the box art for the the manual and for the uh, the cartridge, so you can see the difference. It's uh, significantly cropped. I'm surprised I never noticed that before. Pretty neat. It's uh, what happens when I start reviewing these things and I start making out little details. Man, now that I'm looking at it, it almost looks like there is a signature at the bottom. Hmm. Wow. I wonder if anyone can make that out. If you can make that out and tell me what that says, let me know. Um, might just be a scribble. <laughs> it also looks like there's a lot of scribbling on the planet. I'm looking at the uh, the bottom of the green planet or moon or planetoid or asteroid or whatever that's supposed to be. And here again is the back of the uh, cartridge. And you can see it's very similar to the back of the uh, of the box, which is, uh, so it, except this is blue in this case. 
And that's the top of the cartridge. And that is all I have to show for all of the box, the cartridge, and the manual. And like I said, there's no overlay. Next up, I'll be showing you how the game works and how it looks and how it plays. And you'll get to see me play it for a while. And I also, if you can put up with this long video, uh, I made up a backstory that's going to take up the last mm, eight minutes or so of this video. And you can listen to my backstory that I made for the game while you watch me play it. Hi, today I'm reviewing cartridge number two, Space Attack for the Emerson Arcadia 2001. This game came out in 1982 and it's kind of a Galaxian clone. I'm going to show you what the inside of the box looks like. It opens up like this. The front of the box, back of the box. I've already done close-ups of uh, what it actually looks like when you're uh, when you just have I run my scans, so that looks all right. And uh, probably saying again that uh, this looks like a snow speeder from, uh, what is it, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. This looks like the Millennium Falcon. Uh, I'm sure that's no accident. Game opens up, or the box opens up. And then you have the cartridge, which, despite the fact that it's a complete ripoff of two movies that were recent at the time, um, looks pretty sweet. As always, you've got the uh, manual or the instructions in the back, and the cartridge looks pretty good. You've got uh, the original manual, which I think all the Emerson manuals open up like this. So this one's a trifold. So we've got the front here, got the empty back here, and opens up like that. This one actually comes with uh, some supplementary instructions, which most did not have. This tells you how you can have a demonstration mode, uh, and there's a freeze and unfreeze feature, which allows you to um, take the game and make it so that you can uh, pause it. That's what they call it on this system. So I'm going to take this, put it in here. Uh, I'm going to insert the cartridge in the system here in just a minute. Now I'm going to insert the Space Attack cartridge in the system. Dun, dun, dun. All right, I'll see what happens when I turn it on. As is normal for the Arcadia, turn it on, you got RF. I'm going to turn it on without anything in it. And this is normally what you see, sometimes you just get a whole bunch of garbage. This system doesn't have a BIOS or anything like that. So it's just putting garbage onto the screen. Turn it back off. Let's insert the space cartridge, or space attack cartridge. And voila, there's the game. Now I'll show you a bit how it works. Start off with some RF static and bam, we've got space attack. This game was released in 1982. And I want to read some information from Ward Trake's director's cut of his uh, Digital Press Collector's Guide 7, which he uh, wrote in August of 2002. Uh, this game was released by Emerson, although of course it was uh, written by UA Limited. It's 4K cartridge. Um, its cartridge number is 1013, and it's a clone of Galaxian. It's for one player, and the player uses the right side controller. It's a long cartridge, and the picture on the box, as I've mentioned earlier, and on the cartridge, has a the snow speeder and Millennium Falcon. Um, Ward guesses that this was the second game on the console, and it was reviewed in Electronic Games magazine in November 1982. And you can read more about that in his fact, which is on OrphanGames.com. Um, there's a hidden uh, message inside of the ROM that says, "To my wife Daisy and my son Jonathan from Troy Andrew, July 1982, Galax.002." And he doesn't say this here, but I presume that this is probably called 002 because this game was released in a separate version um, for one of the other systems, it's a, and it's a little more clunky, so maybe that's .001 version. I don't know, that's just my own conjecture. Um, he says that this game is barely one year after uh, the same person put a message inside an Interton VC4000 game called Shootout. Um, that's basically what he has to say. Uh, this game is, like I said, a Galaxian clone, and I'm going to play one game, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the manual. So, here we go. Uh, as you can see, I'm playing. Where's my ship? For some reason, they decided to place it off the screen, and there it is. Um, there's not much to this game. It's basically kind of a uh, Galaxian clone, um, but it's, it's pretty... Um, pretty hard because you can see that I have an energy bar on the left hand side and I'm um, 
I, I think it lasts about 46 seconds. So if I don't clear an entire level within 46 seconds, I lose a life. So if you're slow, like I am most of the time, you only get three lives and your games are gonna last about two and a half minutes. And as you can see, I'm almost out of time. I haven't shot yet, because I'm just wanting to show you what happens here. Um, like in Galaxian, you get more points, that's it. It's my first guy gone, I didn't even get hit by anything, as you can see. This time I'm gonna come onto the screen, and, oh, once you're on the screen, baby, you, uh, once you're on the screen, you can't uh, go back to where you started from. So I can fire using the left and right controls, uh, can fire buttons, or you can press any of the buttons in the middle row, which is actually how I prefer to play the game. It's a little more comfortable. So I'm going to start the game over. I'm going to reset the game. And I'm going to press start. And this time I'm actually going to play. I'm uh, firing by pressing the zero button. Yeah, um, and that's, that's about all there is to this game. I'm going to play an entire game now starting from scratch, pressing reset. And what I try to do is, like in Space Invaders, you can clear each side, but if you let one of them get to the top, I'm going to show you what happens. They just go back into the formation, and they usually go to the extreme left or the extreme right, which makes it so it doesn't matter if you clear the extreme sides, because um, it, you, they still bounce back and forth right away. Does that make any sense? I'm sort of distracted by trying to avoid uh, not being hit here. I'll try to give a better description here in a little bit. I'm going to start over once more. And now I'm not going to talk, I'm just going to let the game play. One life gone. And as each level progresses, uh, the, they fire faster and they also move faster. And as they get closer to the ground, it gets harder to hit them because it seems that uh, they shoot more and if your shot hits their shot. Now, I'm, I'm, there's a bug in this game and as they get below the star field, they start moving slower and slower, which is what they're doing right now. It's probably hard to tell, because you can't see, they, as soon as they hit the, where the star field was, and my firing doesn't happen as quickly. Back. I think I got one more guy. Come off on the other side just to show you. Ah, that's it. I'll play a couple more games here, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, that's not very exciting. Oh, I should press start. Actually, I can also put this into a demo mode, and I'll just let that go on. But I'm going to turn it down, because it is pretty annoying. And I'll talk about the game a little bit. Alright, so in the manual, uh, it talks about the point of this game is to score as many points as possible and that points are gained by shooting down the invading enemy spaceships with the missiles. The enemy spaceships will fire rockets back at your missile launcher and that's my ship. I don't know why it calls it a missile launcher and it says I must avoid their shots. Watch out for the enemy ships that will try to crash into you. And they, as you saw as I was playing earlier, they sort of zigzag back and forth. On the bottom left of the screen is located a fuel gauge to indicate the fuel of the missile in com the fuel of the missile in combat, which is just an awkward way of saying my missile launcher or my ship. Um, almost all of these Emerson manuals have awkward English. Um, 
When the gauge is indicating empty, a warning signal is heard. And of course it's not indicating empty because you still have some fuel left. It's indicating that you're getting low on fuel. If the missile launcher continues fighting when the gauge indicates empty, the missile launcher explodes and the next one continues the combat. Well, you have no choice. You're not just going to sit there and uh, not fire, but either way, uh, you when your energy runs low, you explode. Um, the number that is located on the bottom right of the screen indicates the group of attackers. Um, after group 1 is eliminated, the second group of attackers appears on the screen and changes to number 2. So where it says D1, it becomes D2. The firing from the enemy ships will be more and more intense as the group number becomes greater. And then it tells you how to play the game. Um, which I'm not really going to get into because you watched me play. <clears throat> when you get down to 5,000 points, you get... Uh... Oh, excuse me. When you get 5,000 points, you get a free ship. The most points I've gotten in this game, I think, is 9,120 points. The first row of enemies is worth, um, and when it's saying first row, so I'm going to reset, and you can see, reset, and the first row of enemies is the top two, and there's two of them, and when they're in formation, they're worth 60 points, when they're flying towards you, they're worth 200, and the second row down is, um, they're worth 50 points and 100 points, um, when they're flying down at you, which is the case with all of them, I'm not going to go through all the points, but it's very hard to clear, in fact, I don't think I've ever done it. If you're just waiting for them to have more point value, you're going to run out of energy and you're going to blow up. So that is not a good way to play the game. And since I, we, um, I was playing this game for the uh, Arcadia High Score Club, um, I was, there's always options, and this game has no options whatsoever. So that's just, um, you play it, you start it, you play. There are three ways to get bonus points for this round. You can make a video review, which I'm doing whether or not it's edited and uh, uploaded to YouTube before uh, this game is ready or before the round ends on Sunday, which is in a couple days, then uh, we'll see. It probably won't happen. If you document any bugs, well, then you get an extra point. And so far, two of us have documented bugs, and I'm going to go into those bugs right now. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? One member, one member of the group, um, I mean Mark, has documented that he found two bugs. One of them is that it sometimes takes two or three shots to kill an enemy, and he says, I think this is due mostly to shooting them right as they shoot a bullet before you even see them release it, which is true, that is what it's for. Um, and also he happens to notice that it happens in formation, which I think is a bug, and so does he. And um, he says, some uh, times you uh, will shoot an enemy and it kills more than one, which I've also seen happen, so that's another bug. I noted a few more bugs. Let's put it on um, demo mode again. And yeah, there we go. Well, the game is just playing. Um, Some of the other bugs that I've noticed are um, stuck enemy shots. One of the enemy shots gets stuck on screen right in the area where the ship moves around. It's only happened once to me, but basically, as you can see, when they shoot down, if I'll put my enemy, or I'll put my ship on the screen, right about where I was and where I am right now, um, a shot just got stuck. It got about right there where they're shooting, and just stayed there. And I was able to move around. It just got stuck. And eventually, it started going again. But it took about 10 seconds. But the rest of the game plays normal. I was still able to shoot ships. So I was surprised that it start, just eventually fell. Like gravity took over again. Um, I've already mentioned the last enemy ship slow down. So when there's only one enemy left, the game slows down. And sometimes the enemies get missed in formation. Those are the, um, the, the bugs I've noticed. But there might be more. Um, these games seem to be in program quickly just to get them out the door, and uh, so sometimes errors slip through. I'm going to play one more game. I'm going to play one more game just to show you the game. Oh, I guess I should turn it back up. Let's turn it back up to this, and I will start it up. I'll show you a couple things here. How if they get close to the bottom of the screen, they start shooting faster and you can miss them. Well, that didn't, it wasn't a good idea because it didn't work. 
shoot me, shoot me fast, shoot me fast. Ah, there we go. Well, what did I say that when I get shot? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Um, I've played this game um, on real hardware and I'm using an NTSC uh, Emerson Arcadia 2001 and I live here in the United States, so that's pretty typical for this region. But this system was released in many areas and this is a really common game. I think it was released for nearly all the systems. Um, and depending on what country you get, um, you get the same thing except for one system, you get an earlier version, it seems, and that version is pretty clunky. Um, if I was I have a multi-card I could show it to you, but it's, it looks similar, but it plays not as well. In fact, it looks identical, but it plays not as good. And just by looking at it on the screen, unless you're looking at the title screen, did you see that? Uh, my shot went through the top enemy. And my energy ran out. My game is over. So that's about all I'm going to show. If you stick around, I'm actually going to uh, read a backstory that I wrote. And I'll put this in, um, or I'll play a couple games here and just uh, see what happens. But the backstory is going to um, be something that wasn't included in the manual. I'll record that separately using my uh, Blue Yeti mic. So it should sound a little better. And uh, But I will uh, overlay it over me playing some games with the sound all the way down. I did make some observations while I was playing this game. Some of them are that there's 50 aliens per level. If you fire repeatedly, uh, you can press the fire button 65 times before your uh, fuel runs out, but that's only if you fire constantly over and over and over again and aren't actually trying to aim because that slows you down quite a bit. The fuel gauge is made up of eight segments. Um, and using a stopwatch, because I'm a nerd, I saw that the first segment of the gauge lasts about 16 seconds, but each of the seven remaining fuel segments lasts about four and a quarter seconds. Uh, that's a total of 46.75 seconds. And when you're down to your last fuel segments left, um, you get a warning noise, and that's about eight seconds before your ship explodes. And as I've mentioned, uh, the fuel gauge ruins this game. Your fuel lasts about 47 seconds, um, and if you don't earn an extra life at 5,000 points and don't clear a wave with each ship, then a maximum game lasts two minutes and 21 seconds, which is pretty short. Um, but it, the, one good thing about that is you get to play the game over and over, and you can try to best that. Um, unfortunately, the Arcadia controller doesn't really cooperate. It's not known to be the best controller, and this is one of those games that it's not so good on. I have been playing it uh, using the um, Win emulator for it, or the, excuse me, Win Arcadia emulator for it, and um, using a better controller. It's a little easier on the hands, that is for sure. If there's only one ship left on the screen and you die, um, then the level is complete, um, which doesn't make a lot of sense, and I presume is a bug. I've destroyed more than one enemy ship with a shot, which is kind of weird, and I've mentioned before. And some shots will pass right through a ship when they're in formation, which is obviously a bug. And the manual does say that the aliens move and shoot faster with each level. But for me, the game is nearly too fast by level four. Maybe um, I need to get used to it, I don't know. I have been playing Space Attack uh, for the last week or so. And uh, a few days ago, October 18th, 2017, I wrote a backstory for the game that was a way to get a bonus point. And the idea here is that you're listening to this while you're watching some video play of some of my games. Here's the backstory for the game. Maybe it would have been great if this had been originally in the manual, or maybe this is extremely not good, but either way, I enjoyed writing it. Here we go. The perfectly white outline of the asteroid heads straight for you. This one is small and it's flying fast. You can't turn your ship quickly enough to shoot it into the blackness of space. You have no choice. You take your chances and do the unthinkable. You press the hyperspace button. You don't know where you'll end up, but it must be better than the, than the death which was coming your way. You watch outside your ship as the sharp black and white contrast of your world fades away. You've heard from other pilots that the coming back from hyperspace jump can be nauseating. You don't feel sick as you begin to come to your senses, but you do feel mm, somewhat different. You've heard the experience described as having every atom in your body fired from a cannon straight through a screen that separates every molecule of your body. It's not the flying apart that hurts, it's the coming back together. And damn, if those crazy hyperspace using pilots weren't right. You feel like shit. Not only do you feel awful, but something has happened to your eyesight. The world that you know, constructed of white lines connected to ever more white lines built upon an empty universe, is gone. Well, that's not right. It's not gone, it's just, well, different. Your world, as presented to you by your own eyes, has been altered. It's not worse. It's not better. It's just changed. 
you have no previous experiences to help you understand what you're seeing. Over the years, you have heard many tales from pilots who have returned from hyperspace, but you've never heard a story like what is happening to you. Instead of the world consisting of interconnected lines, your vision is giving you something else altogether. You see something, but know not what it is that you're witness to here after your return from hyperspace. You're still in space, for there is darkness all around you, but that's a comfort. That's the only thing you can relate to right now, space. The sharpness that you've seen your entire life has been blurred. The contrast has been turned up too far. Lines have turned into, well, something else. To express it in words, you think back to your college days when the instructor vectored a square, overlapped by another square, and connected it at 30 degree angles by four lines. He called this object a cube. This cube existed in a theorized world made up of an extra dimension. This would be the third dimension. As a student, you really didn't understand this theory, and you still don't. But it's clear to you that what you're seeing now has some basis in what you saw then. Except, that's not exactly right. There is far more to this hyperspace-induced mirage than an added dimension. Your own ship has changed, too. Your console, your seat, your vector display. It's all different. That's when you have the most intense shock of all. You look at your hand. Instead of being made up of millions of small white lines, it's made up of, well, no lines at all. That's impossible, of course. The entire universe is made up of points and lines. What else is there? Can you trust your own eyes? Is what you're seeing real? What the hell happened to you while you were in that infinitely small hiccup in time called hyperspace? You see and think of this in seconds. You feel as though your mind is working faster than it ever has before. So fast, in fact, that as soon as you notice the strangely shaped objects on, in your <clears throat> view screen, you somehow know that these are three-dimensional ships. They're lined up in several sections to create one formation made up of seven rows. They're working their way towards you. You can tell, just as the pilots of these ships can tell, that you don't belong here, not in this universe. Somehow, you've slipped from one dimension to another, and these ships are here to stop you. They're not planning to return you to where you're from, they're just going to destroy you. To them, you're a cancer. They don't understand you, and you don't understand them. Just as you can't explain it, they also don't know how you got here. They don't know why, and they don't care. Alien ships begin to leave the formation and dive toward you. That's when you look down and see the warning light flashing on and off. Your hyperdrive engine is locked up and it's overheating your fuel. A bar graph shows you how much time you have left before your ship explodes. The scale on the graph tells you that you have 47 seconds before you are no more. You sense that these ships are going to try to give you even less time than that. If you want to live more than that mere 47 seconds, then you must clear a way to escape your ship. But to do that, you'll have to destroy those ships that are coming in your direction. They're already beginning to fire on you. You must defend yourself if you want to live. Your ship tracking system shows that there are 50 total ships, two of which are moving towards you in a strange, semi-predictable zigzag pattern. You don't have time to think, only to react. Luckily, you've been trained to react quickly. You have one major advantage, for you're used to shooting asteroids, which break up into ever smaller pieces, which also must be destroyed. These ships explode into nothingness with one pulse from your laser, not even debris is left behind. In this universe, your ship's laser cannon seems to be far more powerful. As you fire your first shot, you ask yourself, are 47 seconds enough time to destroy 50 ships? And if it is, then what will you do afterward? You tighten your grip on your joystick and begin firing as quickly as you can manage it. As the number of ships begin to dwindle ever closer to nothing, you hear a warning sound. You're just eight seconds away from your ship exploding. Your next shot takes out one of the last two ships, and then something strange happens. The beeping begins to slow down. Your cannon fires slower. You're moving slower. But it's not just you. The last ship is moving slower too. Something is not right here. Something is happening. You feel almost as though you're re-entering a hyperspace fold as you see the final alien vanished before your eyes. The beeping stops, and... You've heard from other pilots that the coming back from hyperspace can be nauseating. You don't feel sick as you begin to come to your senses, but you feel different. That's my backstory for Space Attack. I'm pleased with it, uh, mostly because it didn't take too much effort. When I wrote it, I woke up around 5.45 in the morning, or should I say not woke up, but I'd been laying in bed awake for a while, and I decided uh, I got this idea in my head for this backstory, which is going to earn me an extra point for the uh, 
Arcadia 2001 High Score Club. And what I, uh, when I woke up at uh, that time, I, it was only to jot down this idea that I had. And I wrote uh, a pretty crude little handwritten paragraph that said, the asteroid is heading straight for you. Press hyperspace and jump to the world of space attack and time repeat loop. Each level starts over with exiting from asteroids hyperspace forever. Fuel limit is caused from hyperspace drive malfunction. And that's what I wrote down. And then I basically wrote my story based on that idea. And while you were listening to the story, hopefully it became clear that um, you're actually a pilot in the game Asteroids, and that's why everything is white and um, your, this world looks so different. Um, the story took me about an hour and a half to write and edit and upload, and also to write this little afterword that I came up with. In the story, I tried to explain the mechanics of the game. For instance, uh, the, the unusual slowdown bug that occurs when there's only one alien left is how I came up with the idea for the uh, time warp sequence. If the story continued, our poor pilot, you, would repeat the 47 second process over and over until, well, forever, poor guy. Since UA Limited couldn't come up with their own storyline for Space Attack, it's up to us to give the game more depth. So if you have played the game and enjoy it, um, use your imagination, write something down, and maybe you can even post it somewhere, um, maybe to the Yahoo group for the Arcadia, and uh, I'd love to read it. Thanks for watching this video, and uh, I'll be uploading another video in the next week or two.